listening to the Go and Tell Gals podcast, and I'm your host, Jess Connolly. On each episode, I'll have a guest who will give us a peek into what it looks like for her to run on mission in her everyday life. Our prayer is that it leaves you encouraged and spurred on to go and tell the good news right where you're at. Hello, friends. This episode today is an interview with a gal that I came across online and basically developed an internet crush over. I don't know if you ever have women like that, that you just watch their life, you listen to their words, and you want to know more. You want to know what drives them. You want to know what gets them excited. You want to understand them. You like to listen to how they interact with people and what they say about God. And that's what happened with me and Zim. I came across her Instagram account and I just was so curious and I wanted to know more. And so this is the very beginning of a conversation that we had. Here's what I want you to know about Zim going in is she has accomplished a lot. She has a very, very, very full life. You're going to listen to me (laughs) really realize how out of my league I am when she begins to talk about cloning genes and starting businesses and just all that God's done and then through her. But the thing that I want you to notice is that she's allowed God to use her achievements and her experiences, not just to know him better, but to have more empathy and love for people. That's what's really marking me about this episode. If you ever crave hearing from women who have a different set of circumstances or a different story or have been in a lot of different situations, Zim is your gal. So I pray you enjoy this episode, grab a cup of coffee, grab some tea, and listen to all that God has done in and through her life and be encouraged. I am really, really, really thankful to talk to our guest today, Zim, because I want to be your friend. Like in general, I'm waiting for (laughs) when we get to go to coffee. So, hey, thank you for making the time to chat with us today. Of course. I'm so excited. Okay. Tell all the gals about you. What do you do? What is life like? I know a little bit, but even I want to know even more. Okay, cool. I often can't tell my own story in isolation. Mm. This, I guess, is part of my storyteller brain, but I always go back to the beginning. So bear with me. My mom and my father were in an arranged marriage. um, So they're both from Nigeria. My entire family is from Nigeria. So my mom moves to the United States and my father ended up being extremely abusive. Mm. And so uh, one day he brought a gun home and, you know, mom wasn't having it. I think I was one one at a time. My brother was closer to two. And so my mom on my father's next business trip packed us up and we took our first cross country road trip down to Texas and over to California where we had one cousin in the States. And that was kind of the beginning of this life of exploration that that's been so, I guess, ingrained in me. So throughout the years, we eventually ended back in Minnesota. And those are the best years of my life. I was able to explore. My mom worked as a nurse, so she had the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. shift. So oftentimes after school, we would just go and hang out with our Motley crew of seven-year-olds or six-year-olds and just have the time of our lives. I learned there how important it was to embrace this difference that I saw every day. Grew up in Rochester, Minnesota. There weren't very many people who looked like me, who had my hair type. And so I became very, very comfortable with being different. So fast forward to college, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to be. My parents and my entire family, there's like this Nigerian saying that you can be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or a failure. Those are the four things. (laughs) If you don't fall in in any of the categories, if you're not a doctor, a lawyer, engineer, then who are you basically? And so I went into my undergrad as a biology major. And I worked in uh, genetics. I worked in a genetics lab. So when I was 19, I cloned a gene with similarities to uh, a malfacial cranial disorder. And so I traveled around the country as this young person talking about my research. So that was really cool. I worked in anti-tobacco for a while. So my best friend and I, we traveled the country talking to young people about tobacco and and the effects of it and, and all of the bad things. I started an organization to open a civil rights museum. So I did all of these things in college. And then I got to a point where 
I wanted to take all that I was learning about organizing communities. I had spent a summer organizing churches in San Francisco. I wanted to take my experiences and apply them to an international setting. So right after I graduated college, I sold everything that I owned and I moved to India. And that was kind of a renegade move because the only other time that I'd been out of the country was with my mom and my brother. And that was when I was 17. So I went from traveling outside of the country with my parents to moving abroad to India of all places right after college. And India is one of my favorite places. It is an incredibly challenging place though. And I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about my relationship with God there continue to fast forward. This is like the abbreviated story. I land back in California after my year in India and backpacking through Southeast Asia. And I was broke as a joke. I had no money at all. So I stayed with my parents and every day my mom reminded me of this nursing program or this post back or this post doc program that I needed to be doing. And I was like, mom, I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a nurse. But you know, when you're in the job hunt and you're in the middle of the job hunt and you're so discouraged because nobody is taking you seriously, you almost start to doubt yourself, right? You're like, I, I know I went to college. I know I'm skilled in all these things, but nobody wants to hire me. So six months in, I told my mom that I loved her. I had $200 in my bank account and I moved to San Francisco. I took a bus. I bought a bus ticket and moved to San Francisco and I slept on a couch for six months. And um, <laughs> that was an interesting experience. I had four jobs. I sold luxury sunglasses. I was a nanny. I was doing all of, all wow. of the things. And eventually I landed a full-time job about six months into you know, working these four jobs and having a $3 a day budget and all of these things. I land this full-time job. And uh, two months after that, I start my company. And I work on those things in tandem for about a little less than a year, about 10 months before I'm fired from my full-time job and launched into full-time entrepreneurship. And my company, Travel Noir, we created uh, small group experiences for travelers. We focused on local experiences, local immersion. How can you understand what a culture is truly like? What is it like to live as those people on a day-to-day -day basis? So we traveled not to see things, but to meet people. Um, and so we ran about 60 trips a year across five continents. We did all of the things related to travel and how to vacation more and how to get your boss to let you take a two month sabbatical or all of these different hacks as it relates to travel and living this really interesting life on your terms where you can travel and explore the world and meet people and witness to them and do all these different things. That was a part of the work that I did. And then last year, God told me to sell it. So <laughs> I had thought I was going to run it forever. That's what I thought. And God had other plans and he told me to sell it. And the thing about obedience and disobedience is that half obedience is still disobedience, right? Um, we see that with, with um, King Saul. It was the most challenging experience for me because I had wrapped my identity in this company, right? Travel was my life. It was what I did. It was who people knew me for. And to have that thing or to be told, you need to give this up and to give it up, you start to go into this like crisis, right? It's, it's like when things are stripped away from you, who, who are you? Right. And so I think that that whole process has been really interesting. It's, it's been kind of refining, right? It's been like, I'm in the fire, but God is, is with me and he's teaching me and he's counseling me and he's guiding me. So that was literally 30 years of my life in 10 minutes. <laughs> So hopefully that gives you an idea of my story up until now. And, and, and yeah, so that's kind of where I am now. I'm, I'm traveling. I'm teaching small business owners about the power of story-based marketing. As you can tell, I am a storyteller. Yeah. And I'm starting to work with entrepreneurs in developing countries to help them grow their businesses. I purchased a fixer-upper property this past year, yeah. which is almost kind of like Tom Hanks' movie Money Pit. I don't know if you've ever seen that, <laughs> um, but it's been, a, it's been a very interesting experience, a humbling one nonetheless. And so that's what my life looks like. First of all, I've never been so quiet in an interview, but I'm like, wait, hold on. <laughs> hold on. D wait, did she say cloned a gene? <laughs> you didn't say like 
dyed your jeans. You said like cloned <laughs> a jean. <laughs> so oh I'm a little God. out of my league. <laughs> Oh my gosh, stop it. Listen, I'm I'm okay with it. I love to surround myself with people who know more and have done more. But I'm just like, okay, right, cloned a gene. (laughs) Soul of the luxury sunglasses. Like what I'm what I'm hearing is like you have seen a lot and you have done a lot. And I mean, almost all that's coming to my mind is that, that Apostle Paul, I have been in plenty. I have been in want. Yeah. I just, I'm curious what all of this has led you to know about God. The like very hard, broken parts of your story, the beautiful, incredible, yeah. like he's obviously given you a mind that is exceptional. After all this, in the middle of all this, what do you know about God? I think for the longest time, I used to beat myself up because I didn't fit in this cookie cutter box, right? Like the way that I thought about the world was always very different. It was always different. And I think that any person looking at the things that I've done in my life, I'm 30. I just turned 30 this year. Looking at the things that I've done, it all felt for a very long time, extremely random extremely random. Like I went from cloning a gene to becoming, you know, the youngest precinct judge in the state of North Carolina. I did all these like really interesting things, but they all seemed incredibly random. (laughs) But what I've, what I've learned is that God was teaching me about these, these building blocks and how I could use certain parts of my life and certain stories and certain threads to relate to other people. Right. I, I lived (laughs) on $3 a day. So it was, I had to choose between whether or not I was going to eat or whether or not I was going to pay the bus fare. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that conversation with somebody who's struggling or who's in a place of struggle looks different than what my life looks like now. So I'm able to relate to people better because I've done all of these different things. Somebody asked me a question about feeling really discouraged in their job hunt. They had been without a job, I think for 18 months. And I remember when I was in that place, when I was at home with my parents and they had this expectation of me, like, this is who we want you to be. And I knew that I didn't want to do that, but all of the jobs were telling me, no, they were like, sorry, you you just don't fit. We just can't have you. Like we can't afford you or, and I mean, I was like, I, I would take anything honestly. And I did take anything when I moved to San Francisco and I, and I had to take anything. And so those different seasons taught me how to relate to people better. And so I think that that's, you know, Paul talks about being all things to all people, right? And um, being able to conform and think about my life in different stages and, and where I've been helps me to talk to people from an empathetic point of view. Yeah. You know, I've been there, I've seen that. Yeah, I have so many questions. <laughs> I want to ask all of them. <laughs> I'll start with this one. It's like a statement and a question all wrapped in one. I'm very encouraged. So here is my short story. If anybody's listening to the podcast, they know a little bit about this. But my short story is that I am not what the world deems as intelligent. And that is okay with me. What I affirm and believe is that I have the mind of Christ. And so I can comprehend what he needs me to comprehend. I can... I'm the like girl who failed English in high school, who somehow has written, you know, four books in two years. So my mental capacity is what God wants it to be and is only limited by his limits, which is nothing. So I affirm that my mind can do what it needs to do. But as the world standards go, you know, when my fourth grader asks for help with math, they don't come to me. (laughs) But I am always very encouraged by very wise people who love God because of that. I'm always very encouraged by people who understand what it would mean to clone a gene and like still put (laughs) their faith in an unseen God. Right. Is there a sense amongst people of science that like they are affirming this has to be God? You know, it's so interesting because the way that I've seen God and the way that I've been with God over the years has also changed. Mm -hmm. Right. So I remember taking, um, you know, if you're in bio, you're, you have to take, you know, evolutionary biology, which walks you through 
basically they teach you how we came from, you know, like little fish or whatever, you know? And so you, you have to take those classes and there was always this conflict Right. And it was something that I wasn't able to explain. And it, it's now that I think about it, like I'm not in the field of science anymore. Um, I can relate to scientists, but I'm not I'm not in that in that world. I'm not in the research world anymore. But there are things that people will say, oh, I like it's inexplicable, mm-hmm. but they won't say it has to be God. Right. It, it's like, oh, this is like you know, this is just something that we can't explain, but they, they don't attribute it correctly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I've seen more of, I've seen more of that than seeing folks who would just downright say that, you know, that has to be God. Yeah. All right. What does mission look like right now? Like, what does it look like right now in this season to use what you've got for the good of others and the glory of God? Mission for me in this season has been about identity. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but what happens when you experience this shift that's so drastic, so life changing, so world flipping, or you lose the things that define you, who, who are you then? And I think for me, mission is figuring that out. It's mm-hmm. being submitted to my spiritual authority, my pastors. It's about serving where I can, where I'm needed. It's about intense note taking and recalling what are the things that the Lord is showing me? What are the things that he's giving me in dreams? What does God want me to see and tracking God? My pastor always tells me that you can track what God is doing. God is taking you from one place to the other. You can, you can track him. And so making sure that I'm intentional and being a student of what I'm seeing in my daily life mission for me has been about chasing slow. Right. It's been about running to slowness or running to weight and trying to be learning to be content in that. It's about understanding God's definition of success. It's not about how much money you have or how popular you are or how the world sees you. Success in the Bible has always been defined by what people are willing to give up. Even greater than what we're willing to give up. If God tells us to give that thing up, are we going to do it? Right. The Bible talks about obedience being better than sacrifice, right? So if you are, if you know that you're sacrificing this thing and God tells you to do it, then you don't do it. That's disobedient. So mission to me is understanding that, yes, I can sacrifice something, but if God's telling me to sacrifice it, I should do it. I should be obedient. I should do it. Even if it doesn't make sense to me, if it doesn't make sense in the moment, Obedience is better than sacrifice. And then lastly, mission for me has been dealing with the transition of friends. And and any season of life, really, you think about the people that are standing with you. They're walking side by side with you. And you go through this challenge or you're you're being upgraded, essentially, to another level, to the next level. And those friends, you know, don't, they're not coming with you. Right. And so dealing with that transition of friends is always hard because it brings in this element of loneliness and we have to learn to replace the feeling of loneliness with being submerged in, in the word of God and with people who can speak life to you in, in whatever circumstance that, that you're dealing with. Wow. Yeah, that's real. What's helping you right now? What's help, what tools are helping you do what you're supposed to do? I just got this planner, which is really interesting. It's called the Full Focus Planner by Michael Hyatt. I posted about it a few days ago. I but saw that you posted it, and my husband is the world's biggest Full Focus Planner like fan that I've ever met. He's, he's on his, I think, his fourth one. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. So I think this year, I've, I've literally felt like... What's stuck is not the word, but like unmotivated. Like, I just don't care. Like, it's been so hard for me to stir myself up in work, in the things that I'm supposed to do. And and it's like this grieving process that has come from having to sell my company in a way that I, you know, I, I didn't want to sell my company at that time, but I had to be obedient. It was very important for me to be obedient. And so this full focus planner has been helping me to think about the things that God has shown me, the doors that he's opened for me and how to make those things happen, 
how to be smart about that, how to be productive. And so I've really enjoyed the full focus planner. So that's a tool that I really love. God has given me new friends, people who have really strong empathy, wonderful empathy, and who can continue to speak life into me. He's given me dreams. I remember when I was going through the thick of selling my company, I would have all of these crazy dreams. They were so crazy. I mean, I'm talking about like getting shot at Mm. in the chest, Mm. surviving. I would get these dreams and then something would happen. And I remember sitting in my pastor's office and I was bawling my eyes out and I would take these dreams. I would write them down. I would go in scripture and I would study coming a student of the things that God was was showing me. And like one of the most powerful things that I, that I learned during that time was that God was so close to me. I mean, he's always close, Yeah. but I intentionally during that process, I shut off people and I focused on God and it was just me and God. And if, you know, I thought that God wouldn't speak to me in the way that he did, it literally felt like he was beside me. He was laying in the bed. Like it, it yes. felt like he was right there. When I needed something, when I, when I needed to make a decision, he was right there. Like it was, it was the most surreal thing. And so God has given me these, these dreams. He's given me this hope. We have this promise of harvest. We always have this promise of harvest that if we plant good seeds, they will bloom in their own time. So I have that hope. And then he's, you know, he's given me these, these visions, these ideas for the future. I have so many ideas. <laughs> it's actually quite embarrassing sometimes. I'm like, oh, brain, just turn off for a second. I have all of these ideas, but it's such a beautiful thing. And, it, and it's, it's been a process, I think, to get where I am. And especially in a place where I am learning to accept this abundance that God wants for all of us. I think about the scripture that talks about God pruning even the things that bear fruit, Mm. right? So my company was something that was bearing fruit. It was, you know, my life was bearing fruit, all of these different things. But the Bible says that he trims the things that bear fruit so that they may grow more abundantly. And if you ever think about trimming trees or trimming, you know, whatever, you trim them and then the next season they grow bigger, they grow more abundantly. And yeah. so this abundant life is like, it's a season that he's bringing me to and through. And it's been such a blessing to be in the midst of it and, and to witness it. It's been hard. It hasn't been easy, but it's definitely been a blessing. Are any of my friends trying to cut back on the money they spend in the new year. I am, I am. One of the biggest ways I'm doing that is trying not to buy coffee out, just trying to drink coffee at home. And the good news is we have this incredible partnership with Westerop Coffee. And so I get to have delicious coffee that changes the world at home. I don't have to go anywhere else. I don't have to spend any extra money. Here's what I've learned about Westerop. Westrock's a brand that is changing lives by providing coffee that you can be proud to drink in your home. You want three cups a day, you want four cups a day, don't be embarrassed because you're drinking coffee that impacts the world. They focus on being a catalyst for real change in the lives of farmers and their families by paying a fair price for the coffee in their blends and offering farmers training to enhance the quality and quantity of their crops, which means we get better coffee and we get more of it. My favorite part about West Rock is that you can get it at local stores, you can get it at Kroger or at Bilo, but you can also just get it on Amazon. So we all know that that makes it 10 times easier to get anything if we can get it via Amazon. I hope that helps you. Number one, cut back on the amount of money you're spending outside of your house if that's a goal for you. And number two, just partner with a company that's actually impacting the world in a really, really beautiful way. You can go to westrockcoffee.com to find out more. Okay, I feel like this entire conversation is so just chock full of wisdom and encouragement. We're going to end on some fun questions, which I'm ready for, but also like, you know, just keep bringing the wisdom because... I, if, they, if we need to bring up the fun <laughs> questions, then they need to get serious. I'm down for that too. Okay. okay. First of all, I, 
we didn't prep you for this. Do you know your Enneagram number? Do you care about the Enneagram? If you do know, what's your number? You know, I feel like I have a number that I want to say, but I don't know if it's rooted in any, anything, so I'm not going to say it. Okay. However, I am an INFP. Okay. And I'm an extreme introvert. Although, I will talk to people. I'm like one of those fake extroverts. Yes. Like, I'll talk to you, smile at you, we'll have a deep conversation, and then I go home and I don't leave for two days. Yes. So I have been flying every week since the end of October. And I didn't know that I'd been flying every week since the end of October until a couple days ago. And it is the middle of December right now. So I came home on Sunday and I did not leave my house until yesterday, which is Wednesday. So it was just like this. I I have so much comfort, I guess, with with being with myself and being alone. And my boyfriend, Jason, is almost the same way. Like he's very rooted in his aloneness, but I I found so much peace and solitude in that. So there's the introvert part of me, but I I actually do want to do my Enneagram. I've heard people talk about it more and more. Uh, What are you? I'm curious. I'm an eight, an eight, seven. So that's the, like the controller. Okay. Um, okay. The controller, the controller, the controller and the enthusiast seven is the enthusiast. So, um, yeah, Uh, there are a lot of like horrible eights in history, (laughs) but there are a lot of really healthy eights. So, you know, okay. Next fun question is book you're currently reading. So the book I'm currently reading, well, not currently, because somebody just got this for me, and it's called Chase the Lion. (gasps) Yes. Somebody got this for me this past weekend, and so I kept telling myself, I was like, oh, I'm going to read this on the plane. It's going to be great. I got on that plane. I went straight to sleep. (laughs) So I... (laughs) It's a, work, it's a work in progress. So that's this is going to be my next um, book, Chase the Lion. Have you read any other Mark Batterson books? No, I've never. I've, I've heard about them. So he did, what, The Circle Maker? Yeah. In a I've never read any. A Lion on but. a Snowy Day, I think is one. Um, yeah, his books are oh, great. Okay. Yeah, I love, I love uh, Mark Batterson. We actually... We actually picked this book up in D.C. at the coffee shop. I don't know the name of the coffee shop, but I guess it's it's the coffee shop that was in the middle of the circle or something. I don't know, but it was like a... Yes. His coffee shop? I don't know. I forgot what it's called. His coffee shop. It's Ebenezer's coffee shop. Yes. On Capitol Hill. And yeah, it's, it's it's a cool story because his church like prayed for that land, prayed for that ground. And now they're just such an incredible light in the middle of Capitol Hill in D.C. So... Yeah. So cool. Yeah. I love that. Okay. What's your coffee order? Speaking of coffee houses. Well, you know, I tell you, I always have a story for everything. I don't know if I'm I'm a huge coffee person. I went to this monastery hotel in Italy this fall and I served there. So I was a volunteer and I had the responsibility, I mean, of doing a lot of things, but also preparing coffee for breakfast and for lunch. And they use those little silver cans. I don't know what to call, I don't know what you call them, but they have and a top and then they twirl the top, like you twirl it on, it has a handle. Yeah, they're like mini percolators, right? That it's basically like it comes up the way it would. What are yes. these called? We have one at our house. I now. don't know. Okay, yeah. So, and then I was like, oh my gosh, great. I don't really like coffee, but you know, I'm feeling this whole Italian thing. So I went to the store and I bought a small one. And I, you know, started with that and, you know, coffee, I'll do it, but I don't love it unless it's like half coffee, half milk, which is almost an assault to coffee lovers everywhere. So, (laughs) um, I'm a big, I'm a big tea drinker. So I love chamomile tea with half and half. This is what I would get at Starbucks. I would get a salted caramel hot chocolate with two extra pumps of mocha for all those who, who are lovers of extra chocolatey hot chocolate. This is the order for you. It's so good. Or I'll just get like a green tea latte, salted caramel. I mean, not salted caramel hot chocolate. I just said that. But what is this? Uh, caramel apple spice. Ooh. It's like apple juice with caramel and cream. And it's Ooh. really nice. I love uh, but I'm a, I'm a tea drinker first and then all of these sugary drinks second. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Our very last question. I think I know that this is going to lead to a story. 
And I say, like, let's just run with it. But I always ask everybody, yeah. what's their favorite lipstick? And you don't wear lipstick, right? No. I No, I wrote in my notes, I put chapstick, which I thought was really funny. So I actually... I think I stopped wearing makeup. This is 2018, so I stopped wearing it maybe a year and a half ago, maybe a year, year and a half ago. And a part of me in this like deeper quest to really know God and celebrate how he made me, I wanted to forego that, right? Like I wanted to focus on my skin. Um, I spent some time in Japan early, earlier this year when my brother was stationed there. And what I saw in regards to like skincare was this very interesting approach. It was like a health approach to, to, to like makeup and, and skincare. And it was that you were eating for the glow. Mm. It was skin first. How can I take care of my skin first so that I don't necessarily need to put anything on top of it? And then I thought about like Japan and Korea's approach to skincare. And then I contrasted that with the U.S.'s approach to skincare, which can sometimes feel like I'm just covering everything up. And so in my quest to really celebrate how God made me, um, I just didn't wear makeup. I don't wear makeup at all. And it's been such a freeing thing. Like I don't have eyebrows. I was a victim of the severe eyebrow plucking era of the nineties <laughs> yes. and in early two thousands and my eyebrows have never recovered. So, you know, I've always been like, when I first started with, you know, not wearing makeup, I was just like, gosh, I like, I can't, I look like an alien. I don't have any eyebrows. I mean, I have eyebrows and they'd grown back partly, but I was always so self-conscious about, um, about that. And I was self-conscious about my skin and the blemishes and like all of these things, hyperpigmentation, all that good stuff. And then one day I just was like, you know what? I'm going to ask my friend what she does. She doesn't wear makeup at all. I want to ask her what her skincare regimen is. And she told me black soap, rose water, toner, air dry, and finish it off with some kind of cream. She uses like snail something, snail cream or snail essence. I don't know, something, okay. something crazy like that. And I'm not going to do that, but <laughs> I, would do, I would do some kind of moisturizer. So I did that and the results were crazy. It was out of this world. And so from there, I really learned to love my skin and love how God made me and, and not feel like when I step outside of the house, people know me, people know my face. I think when I, back in, in college, I remember I used to wear so much makeup, so much makeup that when I didn't wear makeup, people didn't know who I, who I was. Hmm. And for me, it's been such a freeing process of really taking God at his word when he says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. Hmm. Right. Yeah. And, um, it's been such a special experience for me. So yeah. So if I had to choose my favorite lipstick, would be chapstick. There's a chapstick that I like from Soho. I mean, it's a well, it's a Soho house brand, but it's a, it's called Cowshed. It's a it's a chapstick from Cowshed that I really like. And uh, yeah, so that's that's that story. I love it. Well, I'm I'm very yeah. inspired and spurred on by the no makeup. I think the first time you I saw you talk about it online, I messaged you and I was like, uh, oh yeah, I, I remember. Mean, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been known to once before when speaking at a conference, I took off my makeup on stage and passed out oh my God. baby wipes and encouraged everyone to wipe it off theirs. Just to say like, listen, wow. let's be who we are. And I still wear makeup about 20% of the week, but it feels yeah. like my spiritual act of worship to just come out as I am. And yeah. I feel like this is the only way we're going to change the tide of women feeling like they have to be more and more unrealistic right. looking is to show up, yeah. people, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, hey, friend, that was incredible. Thank you so much for taking the time, sharing just so much wisdom, so much encouragement. Um, ladies, I would love to ask you to just pause to pray for my friend Zim, pray for God's will to be done in her life, pray for her wisdom to increase, pray for her energy. Yeah, pray all the good blessings that he has for her right into her path. We are so thankful for you. Thank you. Thank oh, this was so life-giving. Oh, you are Absolutely. incredible. Thank you, girl. Thank you.